Hi there, my name's Keith Scott Mumby. I'm a British MD, although I now live in the USA, founder of the website alternativedoctor.com and also advancedmindstrategies.com. I'm going to talk to you about your brain and start with a really strange, challenging question. Do you really need your brain? In 1980, there was a very famous paper published by a man called Roger Lewin. It was published in the Science Journal and the title was, Is Your Brain Really Necessary? Seems a bit strange, doesn't it? But if I tell you the story, you'll realize why he chose this very catchy title. Uh, Lewin himself wasn't the researcher. He was writing about the work of Professor John Lauber, who was a professor of uh, neurology at the University of Sheffield in the UK. And it concerned a particular student who had a condition called hydrocephalus. His brain or his head was a little larger than normal and that drew it to the attention of medics and eventually he was sent to see Dr. Lauber, Professor Lauber. And when they scanned his brain they found something remarkable which is that he didn't have one or to all intents and purposes he didn't have one. Hydrocephalus is a very unfortunate condition. It's caused by a blockage in drainage of the brain fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid as it's called. This puts pressure on the brain and squeezes it. And what had happened, remember this is a university student, this is not somebody mentally disadvantaged. This was a very clever guy studying at university, studying mathematics. And in fact his IQ turned out to be 126 which is well above average. Remember that 100 is average. And yet he had no discernible brain. How could that be? It, all that was left of his brain tissue was a thin sandwich about one millimeter thick lining the inside of his skull. The rest was water. Well, you know, it's pretty shocking as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, and in fact, uh, he actually graduated with honors from university. He was a pretty clever guy but no brain. So where does that leave us with this story where the brain is supposed to be where we are, live where we think and so on? Anyway, John Lauber eventually collected hundreds of cases like this, which to use Lauber's own words, they had no discernible brain. And yet they were functioning normally. Most of them had normal to maybe even above normal IQs. They were living normal lives. Nobody really knew there was a problem until in some cases it was after death and at autopsy it was found the person simply didn't have a brain or no discernible amount of brain tissue not compared to the normal. Well, of course, this is pretty shocking for the orthodox doctors. They can't explain how this can happen how somebody without a brain can function at all, never mind get a degree in mathematics. Trouble is, of course, they're on the wrong model. The truth is we are not our brain. This is what orthodox science says is true, but it just isn't true and doesn't make any sense once you learn stories like this. So, you know, what is the brain for? Is it of any use at all? Well, actually, the brain is a kind of transducer or tuner it, tuning into information fields and the mind is a field of information all around the person and their brain tunes into this and tunes into this information store. It's not material, it's something immaterial and shocking as it is to the, uh, the, the scientists and medics that think it's all brain, it's all chemistry, it's all electrical impulses. Uh, I'm sorry but it's just wrong. <laughs> So when they come across cases like the ones I've described with people with no discernible brain, to use Lauber's terminology, they're stuck. What is their explanation? Well, they don't have an explanation. They're trying to paper over the cracks and they say things like, well, there's so much redundancy in the brain, uh, you know, that the, what remains is able to adapt and compensate for the missing brain tissue. That's complete bunk, of course. Uh, the other one is, uh, you know, the other old story, we only use 10% of our brains anyway. Well, that's all fair enough, but I mean, these people with hydrocephalus had way less than 10% of normal brain tissue. They had less than 2%, less than 1% in some cases. So, you know, it, this doesn't, it, it doesn't really solve anything. And what's more, the idea we only use 10% of our brains is just junk science anyway from the past, like in the 1930s when 
nobody knew what most of the brain was for or did. They used to speak of, speak of these silent areas. They're not silent at all, and we know in recent years from PET scan technology, brain scans, which are functional scans, those show you what part of the brain is working, that we use all of our brain, not all the time, but uh, you know, shifting backwards and forwards, there's a lot of brain activity. There's no such thing as a, as a silent area, if you like. The brain is very functional. But as I said, you should need to start thinking of it as a transducer, or like a radio set. Okay, the radio set tunes into the programs, but the programs are not, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're from elsewhere. They're not inside the radio, and it's the same with us. So where is memory? That's been a problem, of course. Where does human function and personality take place? If it's not here inside the skull and inside the brain, where is it? Well, it has been an interesting question that's fascinated scientists for over a century. Uh, back in the 40s, a very famous researcher called Carl Lashley went, uh, went in search of traces of memory, that there were somehow physical traces on the brain. He called this concept the engram. Now, don't, let that, you don't get mixed up with the Ron Hubbard's bastardization of this word. Engram to Lashley just meant a physical trace, whether it was chemical or electrical. And he thought it would be easy to find out where memories were located. He took laboratory animals like rats, chopped up their brains, and the idea was as soon as you chopped out a bit and the, the rat could no longer remember how to solve the maze puzzle, for example, then that's where the memory for the maze puzzle lay. Well, it sounds fine in theory, but what happened in practice was that he couldn't find anywhere. He, he removed all of the rat's brains, almost every shred of brain tissue, and these darned rats could still find their way out of the maze. Well, it, I mean, it might seem almost unbelievable, but it's not if the memory isn't in the brain, if the memory is, if you like, out there, in the field. The mind space is around our body. We are in the mind space, but the mind space is not inside us. And this explains strange things that you may be familiar with but never really thought about. Like if you close your eyes and look at a picture of a cat or a, 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 a person or a loved one, you suppose that this picture is in front of you. That's what it feels like. It looks out here, doesn't it? You know, if someone says point to the picture of the cat, the person doesn't point here, the person will point out there. And, of course, regular science says, well, that's just an illusion. That's where it appears to be. I'm telling you, it's not. The picture is out here, which is why you look out here and it seems to be out here when you're looking at a mental picture or, or a memory. So all of these things have got to change, of course. Uh, anyway, l long story short, there's no physical memory then as such. Uh, the, the current explanation has got as far as saying, well, there's no locality for memory. So, so memory is, the expression is, you know, they're saying it's everywhere and it's nowhere in the brain. So it's diffusely held throughout the brain, they say. Well, of course, that's still nonsense because these people with hydrocephalus don't have a brain anyway. So they're really stuck on this physical model. Let me tell you that it's wrong. The non-material model is the only thing that makes sense out of brain and mind. A better idea is Rupert Sheldrake's morphic resonance. And what Sheldrake is saying is that these fields, these fields of information, energy adaptations, they're out there and we just simply tune into them. So if you want to remember something from your past, you tune in and resonate, if you like, uh, with an information field that's lying around us, but is certainly not sitting inside the skull. This, this works a lot better, okay? Now, uh, let me tell you another story that's connected with this. Uh, you know, it's just pushing the boundaries further. Another famous study that was done, uh, published 1986, it was called the Nuns Study. And they looked at nuns living in a common. They were a good population because they were very stable. They all tended to eat the same thing. None of them smoked, they drank very little alcohol, and of course they'd never been pregnant or doing the sex thing, so all those hormone functions were pretty stable too. And these nuns, uh, sweet ladies, agreed to donate their brains to science after they died, and they lived out their lives, you know, whether it was 70s, 80s, 90s. They were asked to do journaling and write about themselves and write about their lives. What emerged was pretty much like I was telling you about with Lorber's work. <clears throat> Several of them turn out to have disastrous Alzheimer's changes in the brain. They should have been not just senile, but demented. And yet they weren't. They were leading normal lives. 
There was a lot more interesting inference to be drawn from this study, but I'll just concentrate on that part, which is they had severe brain damage, if you like, uh, brain changes that were incompatible with normal functions, according to the mind is brain theory. And yet, you know, there was nothing noticeably wrong with these ladies when they were alive. So, it, <laughs> you know, the whole story begins to evaporate. Now, you'll get people who still believe in the, you know, I call it the mind from slime theory, that somehow, you know, molecules and bits of dirt and stuff, chemical stuff, woke up one day, said, hey, you know, I'm aware, I'm, a, I'm awake, I'm here. It's a, co a completely crazy theory. But those that still cling to it, take a lot of comfort from the fact that it's been shown that if you do repetitive learning, brain pathways will fire off over and over until they're sort of grooved in. And therefore it is all the brain and there's nobody driving it, it's just the brain. To me that's a bit like saying if you have a car and the shock absorbers are worn or tires are worn in certain grooves or channels, obviously due to repetitive movements, we, you know, we experience this in a car, wear and tear. Uh, and they're saying, and so that proves that the car doesn't have a driver, and doesn't need a driver. I mean, duh, it <laughs> doesn't even make sense, does it? So where are we going with this? Well, we're going a long way beyond brain is consciousness and brain is the self or the ego. In th uh, the flight of consciousness, if you like, and this is the whole point, is that consciousness is a non-material experience. It does not require a material matrix such as a brain. Or a computer, you know, for those who are waiting for artificial intelligence to wake up in computers. We don't actually need this matrix that the consciousness exists anyway. It's out there and it's non-material. So instead of consciousness being in the mind and the brain and in the physical, uh, it's the other way around. The physical stuff of the mind is, is, is in the mind. I mean, the physical body stuff and the brain stuff is in the mind. If consciousness is supreme, then matter, energy, space and time is within consciousness and not the other way around. Well, of course, some of this is pretty shocking. So if we're out there, what about this thing about self and personality? This comes down to viewpoint. And if a person wants to accept the story and buys into the story that they, their viewpoint, the, them or the ego, is sitting here peeping out through little tiny holes in the skull called eyes at the world, well that's up to the person. The person can have that point of view if they want. If they want to believe that, if they buy into that, that's fine and most people do. I don't. Uh, I belong to another class of people who say I'm not a body, I'm not a brain, I don't need a body even. I can exist outside my body and if you're strong in this and determined then, uh, and there are techniques you can use in fact to get out of your body and travel deliberately out of your body. It can be simple physical things like binaural beats, you know, such as Robert Monroe discovered. Uh, it can be plants and hallucinogens. There are all sorts of ways of doing this, trust me. But the point is that once you've been away from your body and seeing it at a distance and, re and you're still awake, alert, you still feel, you still think, and yet there's the body over there with its brain, then you pretty soon drop this physical location thing. It's all a story. We're forced to buy into this story as kids, but you can break free of it, trust me. And once you understand that we're not the physical, that consciousness is immaterial, all these start, things start to have a solid foundation like out-of-body experiences. It's simple. Instead of making your viewpoint in here, looking out, you can go down the street and make your viewpoint there. You can peep in through the neighbor's windows and tell them what they were doing and all these things have been done. Some of it's quite amusing. Same with near-death experiences. I mean, that's a similar kind of thing where the person is not connected to the physical sensorium. Typically, this happens to a person who is close to death but didn't actually die. And they have extraordinary sensory experiences. Somebody dying in a hospital bed can often hear a conversation going on about themselves in the doctor's common room half a mile away. Or, you know, at home in somebody's house with relatives and friends. They're talking about the deceased, but the deceased isn't dead. They're listening to all this conversation. And as I say, sometimes they come back and they can repeat it all, all back to the people. Well, that's amazing if you haven't got the model. But with this model, it's not only something 
that you know it's interesting or could happen. It's it's almost it's bound to happen, isn't it? If you think about it. Same with remote viewing. You know that a person can travel to a different territory and become aware of what's going on there because I repeat, the person is not relying on the body sensorium. You know the normal things of sight and sound and, and touch and smell and those things. Okay, moving on a little bit. Let me ask you a question. At school, as you, when you were a kid, do you remember sitting daydreaming? You know, maybe teacher was droning on and on about history, boring, and you got this idea of sort of drifting out through the window and drifting off down the street, and pretty soon you were playing magical games. You were in another country, or maybe you were at home playing with the rabbits, or for some of us, you know, down at the beach, for other of us, climbing mountains or doing something out in the wild. Well, of course, that was all imaginary. You were told that. But it's wrong. It was not imaginary. It was really happening to you. You were sold this story that it was all a dream, that it was this childhood nonsense, and you better grow up. And as soon as you grow up properly, you'll realize all this is just an illusion. This is wrong. It's wrong, and it's terribly wrong. The kids are right. The kids have these abilities, and they can travel in non-material spaces. They can have non-material experiences of all kinds. And it's only when the adults crowd in on them and finally persuade the kids this is all bunk, usually about the age of 10 or very soon after, the child begins to realize, oh, well, it's all just imagination. So we say the child is very imaginative. Uh, instead of saying this child is very adept at the use of consciousness, uh, you know, consciousness facilities, we just don't think of it that way, do we? But, you know, shamans do this all the time, just like that daydreaming, trip to a place you know where you're not physically there but you can travel in the consciousness space that's what shamans do they do healing that way they go into these other dimensions and sometimes they can produce remarkable healings and transformations now my definition for this is important and i wrote about this by the way in a book called to fly without wings it's my experiences in studying and learning with a magical being learning to fly without wings or levitation if you like uh, that uh, you know, consciousness experience and things like that, uh, these can actually uh, dictate and regulate what you do. But I gave an example in there, or a definition, as it were, of shamanic journeying that really were, you know, is, is authentic, as it were, which is you travel into these alternative spaces, make a change in the alternative space, and that produces a physical change in the real space. I quoted a friend of mine called Susan Flood, and she. Uh, had a friend whose little baby on uh, x-ray, this is before birth, was seen to have a condition called esophageal atresia. That means no gullet, doesn't join up. So when the kid is swallowed, there's nowhere for the food to go. So my friend Susan did a shamanic journey for this child in the mother's womb, went into the, uh, in this other dimension, if you like, of working, made changes in that space. And you know, the amazing thing is within a week or 10 days, a new x-ray showed that this baby's esophagus had now joined up. So that's something in a magical space causing a repercussion in the real space. We call it magic, but it's only magic if you haven't got a model. If the model is understood and works, it's not ma magic. I mean, it may be outside ordinary science and physics, but it's not magical. You know, there's a, there's a process there that we understand. Okay, now my wife, and before I finish, my wife, uh, you know, talking with me about all these things, had a couple of good questions which you might have. One thing she said, I'm, I'm back to the hydrocephalus cases now where there's no real brain, no detectable brain in these people. What about the right left brain thing, she said. Well, you've got to remember that right and left brain faculties, although they exist, this is a very artificial thing. They only really emerge in their strange and distinctive patterns when you sever the brain, the real brain, when you chop it down the middle. This is Roger Sperry's work going back decades. You probably know that. So then you get an artificial appearance of a certain type of thinking process on the right and a certain type of thinking process on the left. This doesn't happen in life. In, in life, we're both. We all do both things. Some of us are a bit heavier one way than the other, so bringing these into balance is always a good thing. And you can do this with advanced mind technology now, electronics and optics. You can it's called brain integration, where you train the brain to resonate at the same frequency on each side. And a good frequency, you know, like theta or alpha, which is very restful and creative spaces. And then she had another question, which was uppermost in her mind this week, just a couple of days ago. Her auntie had an operation for a brain tumor. 
and she knew that the surgeons would be taking particular care to make sure they didn't damage the speech area here on the left side. Uh, why is that, said my wife, if we don't need physical brain structures anyway? Well, of course, this is a this is a good question too. But let's go back to the radio model, the transducer, the receiver set model. If you have a radio and you take the battery out or damage the battery, it isn't going to work. Uh, if you take out variable capacitors, for example, listen, I'm not an electronics person, but you know, a tuner, electron, uh, a variable capacitor, the thing uh, won't work properly. If you pull out a couple of transistors, the thing isn't going to work properly. And it's the same idea here, really. The, the right and left brain functions are out there in fields. The speech functions are out there in fields. But the person can't access them properly unless they can, you know, unless they have the right sort of tuning in equipment. And, you know, if you take doctors out of the way and just let nature do things, she, she can often work her way around these problems anyway. If a person has a stroke and can't do certain things, then nature will figure a way to get past this blockage. You have to just take the doctors out of the way so they don't mess with things or they don't stand there shaking their heads and saying, you'll never walk again and all this self-fulfilling prophecy stuff. Uh, then nature can fix things. Listen, I've had patients under my care who I've been able to, one, up to 30 years after a stroke or damage has then been able to learn to move the limb again and uh, an 18 year old child who was supposedly brain damaged understood all language and in fact didn't learn to speak when she met me at the age of 18. She just began to speak. She'd understood language all along. That sounds weird unless you remember that language and speech verbal skills are out here. You know, they're not in here. This is just the, the processing unit. If you want a computer analogy, this is just the microprocessor here. Okay, well, listen, I've talked at length. I hope you found that interesting, and I hope I've done something to challenge you with that question. Do you really need a brain? The answer appears to be that you don't really, but I don't want you to use this as an excuse to neglect your brain. You know, look after it, give it the right nutrients, take care of it. Your brain is very precious to you. It's the way we tune into the universe around us, and life would be a bit funny without it. In fact, we just have to live with ghosts, which I don't think is nearly so much fun. All right, thanks very much for watching.